Um, Simone Marchi obtained his PhD in applied physics in 2003 from Pisa University in Italy. Following this, he was a research fellow at Padova University and then a visiting scientist at DLR in Berlin. He then spent two more years at Padova University, followed by a fellowship at the University of Nice and Observatoire de Côte d'Azur in France. Um, in 2011, he was selected as one of NLSI's first institute-level postdoctoral fellows, working jointly for Bill Botkey at Swery in Boulder and David Kring at LPI in Houston. He already has a stellar publication record with a number of publications in both Nature and Science, as well as other top-notch journals, on topics ranging from crater populations on Vesta to the lunar catac cataclysm. Excuse me. A number of these publications resulted in press releases during his time working with NLSI and Serbi. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Simone Markey to give his Niebuhr Award talk. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be here. I want to uh, thank uh, Yvonne, Greg, and all the survey uh, staff for this award. And I'm felt, uh, you know, I feel honored. And uh, I did not know Susan Niebuhr in person, but uh, I found this quote uh, on the web, and uh, I will let you read it. Uh, I, th I believe these are the same words that Greg just uh, told us. And I felt touched by this, and I think that this really applies the way I like to do science. So. I wanted to show and share them with you uh, today. So if you please can, uh, go to the next slide. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is talk my latest work. And this is kind of unusual, perhaps, for this conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Earth and the early evolution of the Earth. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, the, uh, the two uh, uh, survey institutes and, you know, previously NLSI Institute I worked with, the one led by Bill Botke in, uh, in Boulder and the, the other one by David Kring in Houston. Uh, I also want to thank the collaborators for this work that are listed on, on the page. Uh, next slide, please. So um, it's pretty obvious, you know, for someone like myself that have been studying the moon for years, it's pretty obvious uh, to use the moon as a sort of a witness place to the uh, early evolution of the Earth. Uh, if you look at the picture, it's, it's, uh, it's indeed, uh, you know, a, a, a simple idea. Uh, the moon is so close to the Earth that somehow they must have shared a similar uh, collisional histories. You also, in the plot, you also see a schematic view of the timeline for the evolution of the two bodies. So what I'm interested in today for this talk is to understand the bombardment history of the Earth after the formation of the moon. So that is after 4.5 giga year ago uh, or so. Uh, that is uh, what is defined the late accretion of the Earth, and in terms of geological periods, uh, that span the Aedian and early Archean uh, eons. Uh, and of course, the idea is to use constraints from the Moon, like cratering and uh, perhaps also radiometric edges of rocks, to constrain the evolution of the Earth. Next slide, please. Uh, so here is uh, just a brief introduction of where we stand today. This is a plot that shows the, uh, basically the impact flux as a scene of the moon as a function of time. And, and as you see, there is a strong spike, spike at 3.9 giga years ago. Well, that is uh, uh, the concept of the lunar cataclysm, also known as late heavy bombardment, as was introduced, uh, introduced first by Terra et al. in the 70s. Now, uh, if we can go to the next slide, we will see uh, that uh, this view is not, uh, you know, uh, not everyone would agree with that, uh, and in part others would instead claim of the smooth decaying flux um, uh, as seen from the moon. Uh, and in the next slide, it's, uh, it's what we believe is where we stand today. This is a model that we published, uh, thanks to the NLSI, a couple of years ago. And this is what we call the lunar southward bombardment. And the reason for the name is obvious. If you look at the, the blue curve, there is a spike at an optic and the impact flex uh, at around 4.1, 4.2 giga years ago. And that is what we believe uh, represent best all the constraints that we have uh, today. Now, uh, we are going to take this chronology for the moon and we apply this model to the Earth and see what sort of prediction we can make. So next slide. Uh, 
uh, it, we are now going into the details of understanding the evolution of the Earth. Now, uh, the first thing we need to worry when we want to study the late accretion is stochastic nature of the bombardment. In order to track the stochastic nature, we need to have sort of a Monte Carlo approach. So in this plot, you see the mass accreted by the Earth after the formation of the moon. Um, and, and the plot shows uh, 50 different simulations. As you see, there is pretty much of, of a spread in, in, in the accretion of the mass as a function of time. Uh, but of course now, uh, what is important is trying to constrain even farther, uh, you know, and pick up you know, those curves, which one that may best represent the actual uh, evolution of the Earth. And that is done in the next slide. And we do that using uh, a constraint that is from the highly siderophile elements found in the, in the mantle of the Earth. So that is a constraint that tells us the amount of mass that was delivered to the Earth by, uh, during the late accretion. The color coding now shows the simulation that uh, deliver enough mass as according to the highly siderophile elements constraints, and those are coded in red, those in yellow are above, and those in gray stands below uh, what we need to, to have. Uh, so bottom line here, over the thousands of simulations that we run, we found that between 20 and 40 percent of them deliver the right amount of mass, as tell us from the highly siderophile elements. And of course, once you have this, this, this model, uh, you can start doing interesting things. Uh, for instance, uh, you can compute that 90 percent of the mass accreted by the Earth has been delivered by only six plus minus three objects. Therefore, this is a really highly stochastic regime, as I mentioned at the beginning. And of course, now you can use these curves to make a prediction of how the surface of the Earth evolved. So in the next slide, uh, we are now um, a sort of switching a little bit uh, topic. And I want to I wanna discuss a little bit uh, what happened to the surface of the Earth after, as the results of this bombardment. Okay? So one of the things we learned from from oldest rocks and, and, and minerals, like, like uh, zircons, for instance, that are found on Earth, uh, one of the things that we learn is that the early crust of the Earth was uh, characterized by heavy mixing, burial, and perhaps even melting. Okay? This is something that we learn from geochemical constraints on the early Earth. Of course, this process is usually a, has been ascribed to uh, geological evolution, like subduction or even uh, volcanism. But how about impacts? Uh, so in order to assess that, uh, we, uh, we did some modeling. Uh, next slide, please. And here, in this plot, we are focusing on the effect of very large collisions on the early Earth. So this is just a cartoon, but the idea is the following. Basically, if you have an impactor larger than 100 kilometer colliding with the Earth, uh, and a number of interesting things may happen. Well, first, the volume of impact melt that is produced in those collisions is far exceeding the volume of the transient cavity. So this is no regular cratering business. And in particular, what we think is going on is the large volume of melt that is produced may actually extrude on the surface. Okay? Uh, this is an interesting process. And next slide, please. Of course, we did some uh, sophisticated modeling to assess the amount of melt that is produced. This is from using the shock physics code, uh, which is called uh, uh, ISAIL. And what the plot shows is the following. Let's assume that the volume of melt that is produced uh, in this super large collision actually extrudes on the surface. Then, of course, we can compute the, the diameter of that region. For a, for a given thickness of the melt, that in this case is assumed to be three kilometers. And that diameter can be uh, divided by the impactor size, and that is what the y-axis of the plot shows you as a function, of course, of the impactor size. So, so as you see, the white curves will give you the prediction from our modeling. Of course, the, uh, the shock physics code doesn't really give you the full amount of melt that you expect to have. There are additional components like adiabatic melting of you know, the perturbation in the mantle. So we sort of corrected for that, and this will give you the violet curve. And so the bottom line from this plot is that the ratio of the area buried by the melt that is true on the surface respect to the prototype size is of the order of 20 of 30. This is what the F factor that is given in the plot. It's an interesting number, and keep that number in mind. It will come out and the, uh, later on. Next, please. Here is a sort of a, a graphical view of what was going on. I have a bunch of slides now that shows every circle. This is the surface of the Earth. Every circle is, is an impact, and, and the circles give you 
the final crater size, if the impactor is smaller than 100 kilometer, that is regular cratering, so to speak, but if the impactor is larger than 100 kilometer, then we boost the effect due to the extrusion of melt on the surface. And so that's what the circle shows in there. Now I have a bunch of slides to make sort of a fake movie. So if you can please go on with those, you will see how that changed as a function of, of time. Please, uh, next. Okay, next. Next. So you see the color codings give you the age. Next. 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 All right. Now, I think it's pretty obvious if you look at this sort of animation uh, that um, the surface of the Earth, in particular the Aegean Earth, the first 500s of million years, must have been completely affected by the, by the, you know, the cratering business, the collisions. And, uh, and by the way, there is a, an interesting implication of all of this that is about the uh, uh, habitability of the early Earth, something that I do not have time to discuss here today. Uh, next slide, please. Now, of course, when you do heavy modeling, as we like to do, uh, you always want to ask, uh, you know, is this just a story for, for a Sunday magazine, or we can actually constrain what we are doing here? Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, we paid a lot of attention to this question. And if you go to the next slide, uh, uh, and we ended up uh, looking at the Aegean zircons. Now, these are wonderful uh, tiny crystals. The, the size of these uh, minerals is smaller than a millimeter. And they are the oldest samples that we have on the Earth. And in fact, they are older than four giga years ago. Uh, now, uh, there are a number of interesting things we can learn about the, uh, the, the early surface of the Earth, uh, and in particular, um, inclusions within zircons have been used, for instance, to claim the existence of liquid water on the Earth as early as 4.4 giga years ago. But then additional uh, uh, research also suggested that the surface of the Earth must have been uh, you know, excavated and mixed and buried a lot. Um, and, uh, and all of that is learned by uh, studying these tiny crystals. Uh, I think that is really fascinating. But now, of course, this process usually have been, are, you know, ascribed to regular, so to speak, geological evolution, like subduction of volcanism, as we already discussed. Uh, next slide, please. But there is an intri intriguing feature of the Aegean zircons, which is shown in this plot. That is, uh, lead lead age distribution of, of, of thousands of Aegean zircons. It's really, it's really wonderful data set. And what you see in here, there is a strong, uh, peak in, in the ages between 4.1 and 4.2. Now, how you will get that by regular geological evolution, it's not clear. Uh, uh but of course, next slide, please. For us, uh, it's, it's pretty striking uh, to see, next, it's pretty striking to see that that peak is pretty much when we think the LHB took place. Uh, so the natural question for us is perhaps there is a link between the age spectrum of the Dian zircons and the bombardment. Next, please. What you see here is our attempt to uh, to make a link between the impact flux and the Aegean zircon. So I have you already described a key process uh, that was going on in the, in the early Earth, and that is melt extrusions on the surface. Now, if you do that, you are going to bury a depth uh, material that was previously on uh, close to the surface in contact with water, and you are going to push that uh, at depth. And that is perhaps uh, the key point to have to reach eutectic melt conditions that are required to form uh, zircons. So uh, assuming that that is the process that makes new zircons or perhaps reset all the zircons, we can then run a simulation. And at the end of the simulation, we can basically scan the surface of the Earth and make an histogram of the, of the age distribution of, of, of the surface of the Earth as a result of the bombardment and the timing of the impact. So next, please. If you do so, you end up with this histogram. Now, I mean, I would say that that is a remarkable fit with the data. And, um, and therefore, we believe this may be the key to explain uh, Aegean zircon's age distribution. And uh, I also want to point out that this is the only model so far that has been shown to be able to reproduce quantitatively the age spectrum of the zircons. Of course, more work is needed uh, to, you know, to find out um, if this is really uh, a viable process. So next slide. Um, 
I would like to conclude saying that we have a new model for the early bombardment of the Earth. This is really help us understand in the late accretion phase. Uh, most of the mass is delivered by the large projectiles, but smaller projectile uh, may have an intriguing implication in the way in shaping the, the, the way the, the early Earth evolved. And in particular, the signature of that bombardment may be seen today in uh, Edian Zircons. I also want to point out that this is brand new work, and you will see the paper coming out on Nature next week. So uh, uh, hang on for a week, and if you have questions after reading the paper, please you know, come to me. Thank you. Wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Simone, and congratulations.